Hello everyone and good afternoon and welcome to the District 9820 Lift the Lid Afternoon Tea. We've got a presentation this afternoon on diet and mental health. My name is Marty Shepherd. I am the District 9820 Australian Rotary Health Chair and it's my pleasure to introduce Greg Ross, Chairman Australian Rotary Health. Wonderful to join you and First of all, may I say, it's great that Marty Shepherd has become the, um, the representative in 9820 for Australian Rotary Health. She's taken over from Vivian Armstrong, who seems to spend most of her time on Facebook these days, from what I can see. But uh, welcome, Marty, and thank you, uh, District Governor Mark, for appointing her and for being here and giving your imprimatur for this, for this session today. It's pretty special. Uh, I was asked before actually introducing our guest speaker just to give a wee bit of background. It's been my privilege to be on the board for the last seven years and the last three as chair. And quite frankly, by introducing uh, Lift the Lid on Mental Illness, and the idea was to have people from different backgrounds throwing their hats into the air happily from uh, research breakthroughs. That was the idea behind it, and it's, uh, it's been taken up around the country, and that's a wonderful thing. I truly believe that Australian Rotary Health is not only just a great Rotary project, I think it is the greatest homegrown Rotary project. And I've got some reasons for saying it. First of all, it started back in 1981, so it's our longest serving. But from our initial funding in the sudden infant death syndrome, Many, many millions of lives were saved. Now, Professor Terry Dwyer was a young professor, went down from Sydney to Hobart. He's now Professor of Epidemiology at Oxford University, by the way. And he had a 10,000 baby study to try and find out why so many babies were dying from sudden infant death syndrome. Why parents just came in the morning and found their healthy children uh, dead, cold and lifeless in their cots. And the trauma of that was what triggered someone from Mornington, his name is Ian, Ian Scott, to actually say to his club, let's do this. Now, Mornington obviously is in 9820. And so Australian Rotary Health started in this district. And uh, for those of you who go back that way, I joined the Rotary Club of Berwick on the 3rd of June, 1976, and came to 9800 in 1986. So my first 10 years were spent out your way. It was fantastic. The original board of Australian Rotary Health was headed up by Royce Abbey, who was soon to become RI president, and also had Clem Renniff on the board, who had been RI president, and they, were, they set it up beautifully. From that one piece of funding with a 10,000 baby study, in which they thought they were looking at temperature variation or heart or neurological reasons when they looked at the data showing the babies that died the babies that lived sleeping position was the obvious answer and by putting the baby face down its chances of dying went up enormously and so within a decade over 80 percent of cot death was eliminated worldwide from that one piece of funding we then progressed and when we reached 2000, the board decided to look at mental health as the area. And that has just grown and grown. And now we fund some 94, I believe at the moment, uh, research scholars, 80 plus indigenous health uh, scholars. It's, it's a massive undertaking and we're one of the largest non-government funders of mental illness in the country. So I'm, I'm I just, I should let you know that the board, there's a board of 12, it was nine, but the 12, now we have for the first time this year, a representative of the governors, the governors elect and the governors nominee. And it has worked really well. And I'm so thankful that it has, it's fantastic. Uh, we have a staff of only five, all women, and they've been headed up by uh, Joy Gillette, our CEO for over three decades now, she is a powerhouse. And we have a research committee of 13 or so, headed by Professor Jane Perkis, Uni University of Melbourne, well known for her work with suicide and the media. So that we have no say whatsoever in selecting the scholars. Because over 300 
grant submissions are made each year and they have to choose the best 11 or 12 that we end up being able to fund. We have some wonderful stars that have come out and that's why our guest speaker today is very much one of those. I think the important thing I should add is because we have a corpus, over time they've built this corpus and it was up to $18 million before the global financial crisis. It went down to 12, went back up to 14. It's now about 13 and a half. And the interest from that covers the staff costs and all of the other um, things that are needed for directors, for the research committee and a little bit extra. But it means we can say quite honestly that 100% of every donated dollar goes to the research and study programs. And that, that is a fantastic thing to be able to do. And uh, when people might say, well, you've got all that money, why don't you just put it in there? If we hadn't had that corpus, we would have folded as an organization through the GFC and we would have been hard pressed right now. So it means we can play our part. Australian Rotary Health funds new research. Now, as I said, we've got some stars, but today you're gonna to hear one of those and she is a, a trailblazer in the world of the, the, the correlation between diet and mental health. She's a nutritional psychiatrist. She is head of the director of uh, Food and Mood, is it? Food and Mood Center in, at Deakin University. Mm -hmm. Very well known publisher now, and more and more coming out. She gets right down to it with poo and say, well, you'll, you'll hear from her. I don't think I need to say any more. I am so thrilled that she's here at this 9820 function. Would you please welcome, most warmly, Professor Felice Jacker. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much, Greg. And, you know, it's been my great pleasure and privilege to be having a very strong and long association with Australian Rotary Health from when they first funded my PhD study, um, which was right back in 2005. And um, it's fair to say that I wouldn't be sitting here today presenting to you on all of this really groundbreaking and quite transformational research that's had such a global impact if it wasn't for that initial investment from Australian Rotary Health. And, you know, Australian um, mental health research, is, it's always been underfunded and it's always been a it, it's a difficult area for people to get their head around. It's not so straightforward as say, you know, childhood cancer or any of those things. And to have the support of Australian Rotary Health has meant that Australia's continued to be at the forefront of really cutting edge, impactful mental health research. And there's no one in mental health research in Australia who's not really grateful for that. Um, so it's very important for us to acknowledge that Australian Rotary Health has had a big impact so I'm going to share my screen now and walk you through uh, just a little bit of a, an overview of the work that I've done and um, what it means for people individually and what it means for the population more widely um, and give you a sense of, of the impact that it's had. Um, so I'm going to start by putting my research into a very important context and that context is what we call the industrialization of the food system. The global food environment has changed enormously over recent decades and you would all be aware of this when you go to fill up your car with petrol or you walk down the street we see these types of foods everywhere we go these foods are designed deliberately and with great effort to interact with all the reward systems in our brain so that we want to eat them and we want to keep eating them they are also the cheapest the most uh, heavily marketed the most widely available and as a result, we now have a situation where this industrialized food system, which includes, um, you know, forestry and cattle production and all of the things that go into developing these um, ultra processed food products, that industrialized food system is now responsible for cost to the wider health of the population across the globe and the environment of $12 trillion a year estimated to be 16 trillion by 2050, which will make it the equivalent of the GDP of China every single year. Now, as a result of this, we're now in the terrible situation where poor diet is actually the leading cause of illness and early death right across the globe. Overweight now kills more people than underweight. And what we have in many countries, particularly in the West, but increasingly now in other economies, is what we call malnubesity, where people are very overweight, but they're malnourished. 
So it's a terrible situation we find ourselves in. What do we understand about uh, what a, a poor diet looks like? Well, in very general terms, from the research evidence from these big global burden of disease studies, it's diets that are low in plant foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, the foods that are full of fiber, and of course, healthy fats from uh, largely plant foods and uh, to some degree fish. And also, of course, diets high in red meat, processed meats, added sugars, uh, this would be artificial sugars as well, trans fats and added salts. So we know what these foods look like and they're everywhere. At the same time, of course, we're in a terrible situation with our mental health. Across the globe, mental disorders account for the leading cause of global disability. The big blue box is uh, what we call unipolar depression or just depression and the red part is anxiety disorders. These are called the common mental disorders for a very good reason. And they are in uh, particularly depression in the top five causes of disability right across the globe. And disability means not being able to fully participate in the workforce, being uh, more likely to end up in the, the criminal justice system, all of the things that come with disability. Um, and they also, of course, uh, do substantially increase the risk of early death in and of themselves, particularly depression. The fact that these two things are linked is what my research showed, supported by Australian Rotary Health. But this is my PhD study. It ended up on the front cover of the American Journal of Psychiatry. It had a very, very big impact on the field of psychiatry research and it continues to do so. It was the first study to show in a very large representative population of Australian women that the quality of their diets, even when you took into account all of these other important factors like their other health behaviours, their body weight, their socioeconomic status, etc. The quality of their diets was linked to whether or not they had a clinical depressive or an anxiety disorder. So as I said, this was the first study, it was very impactful. And on the basis of this, I was able to go on then and develop the evidence base from studies right around the world. And so now, uh, 10 years later, we have a situation where right across the, the world, whether it's in Norway or Japan or China or wherever it might be, we see this consistent link between the quality of people's diets and their risk for depression in particular. People with healthier diets are about 30% less likely to develop a clinical depression, independent of all those other factors that I mentioned. Very importantly, we see this right across the age range. We know that half of all mental disorders start before the age of 14. If we think about mental disorders, many of the risk factors have traditionally been very hard to address. And this is one of the reasons I think where mental health has uh, attracted less research funding because people see some of these factors as being so difficult to change. Things like family history and genetics, but early life trauma, life stress, poverty and disadvantage, these are all very, very potent risk factors for mental disorders and hard to change. But what we've had over the last 10 years now is this increasingly large and robust body of evidence that there are modifiable things, things that we can change to reduce risk. Um, and one of these is diet, exercise and smoking cigarettes are some of the others. We see, and we've done many studies here and many others have done studies that the diets of young people, our teenagers are inextricably linked to their mental health. Even when we take into account their family environments and all of these other factors I mentioned, Young people who have more of these junk and processed foods, and you'll see them everywhere, they'll be snacking on them on the way to school, they'll have them at lunchtime, they'll have them after school, they are more likely to be depressed, to have mental health problems. Those who have uh, also not enough of these good foods, the foods that are higher in the fiber and the antioxidants and things, they are also more likely to have uh, mental health problems. And these two things are not just the opposite of each other. You can get um, quite a lot of people, particularly young people, who have um, a lot of good healthy food at home, but then they also have a lot of these junk and processed foods. That's a problem. Similarly, there might be many kids who are not going to Macca's after school or Kentucky Fried or having chips and ice cream every day, but they're not getting the high fiber foods, the plant foods, the diversity that they need for 
a healthy gut and a healthy brain. So they're both problematic. And when we go right back to the start of life, we see that this is also true. I led the first study in more than 23,000 mothers and their children to look at mother's diets during pregnancy and children's mental health over the first few years of life, showing that both mother's diets and independently, the diets of children in those first few years are linked to their emotional regulation. And new research from our center tells us that this may have something to do with the gut. And I won't talk about the gut in detail because we don't have a huge amount of time, but people are welcome to ask questions about this because the key to understanding about the gut is that diet is probably the most important factor that affects the gut and it can affect it within hours. And that gives us a very important tool for thinking about change. And the gut in turn affects every aspect of our functioning, our immune system in particular, our body weight and metabolism, every part of our body through gene expression, but also our brain and behavior. And we also led the first randomized control trial to show that if you take people with clinical depression, moderate to serious, severe uh, clinical depression, and you support them to make improvements to their diet, that has a very profound impact on their mental health. And in this study, we showed that people who got dietary support from a dietitian over a three month period, compared to those who got social support, which we know is really helpful, they were much more likely to have a full remission of their depression and a big reduction in their depressive symptoms. This wasn't due to changes in body weight or anything else. This was a very, very important study and this probably more than any other work that we've led has had the largest impact. The work that I have led in this field of what we call nutritional psychiatry research has had such a huge impact that even just this year, we've had major uh, media pieces in Time magazine, in the Oprah magazine, New York Times, every part of uh, the, the Western press that you can think of, and also in many other countries, talking about uh, the work we've done. Because of course, everybody has mental health of one sort or another, everybody eats. This idea that those two things are linked is very powerful for people. It gives them a sense of control. So we're not saying, and this is a very important thing, that poor diet is the only cause of mental illness or that changing your diet is um, going to completely fix everybody. That's not at all the, uh, the message. The message is that there's these fundamental things that you do to improve the health of all these systems, your immune system, your stress response system, your brain health, through diet, exercise, not smoking, um, getting enough sleep, these things are fundamental to all of those systems that then feed into the risk for mental disorders. So you do this as well as your other treatments, not necessarily instead of, although some people do and they find that it, it's helpful. Um, so that's a very important understanding. And one of the reasons why this field has had such a big impact in the public consciousness and increasingly in clinical practice, in um, in the sorts of information that is uh, taught in medical schools and other sorts of schools. We developed a free online course on nutritional psychiatry um, that we launched for the first time last year in November. We've had three runs of it now, and it has enrolled nearly 60,000 students from more than 160 countries around the world. This is having a big impact on people's knowledge and understanding and behavior. We're also working with the peak bodies in Australia, such as the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists to develop accredited training so that the work that we do doesn't just sit in the science area, but actually is translated to uh, changes at the population level and improvements at the population level. Mm -hmm. The Food and Mood Center I founded about three and a half years ago it's grown very quickly. We now have nearly 30 people doing uh, wonderful research, more than 20 different, very important projects underway, right from early life, right up to looking at dementia and the impact of diet and nutrition on dementia risk and the, the fundamental mechanisms by which this might work, such as the gut microbiota. Um, lots of training, as I said, the Food and Mood Center website is a wonderful uh, place to go if you wanna know more about it. Greg mentioned I've published a couple of books. One last year, Brain Changer, is really for adults and it brings together all the science and what we know about nutritional psychiatry. 
but the one I published in August with my husband is a children's book. It's called There's a Zoo in My Poo. And it's designed to give kids and through kids, their parents and teachers, the information that they need to make those basic uh, healthy choices that for their gut that then flows on to the health of their body and brain. Um, it's sold out within a day on Amazon. It's being reprinted at the moment. There should be lots in the shops up to Christmas. Uh, so that's another way that you can get information about this. So I hope that you feel inspired. I hope you recognise just how powerful the work that Australian Rotary Health uh, does is in supporting research that makes a huge difference uh, to people right across the world. So thank you again. We have two Ian Scott Fellows uh, students in the centre at the moment and uh, they are doing really important work and we continue to have a great relationship with Australian Rotary Health. So I'm very happy to answer some questions if we have time for that now and uh, thanks again. Thank you very much Felice. Much appreciated. You can't hear everyone clapping, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much. Look, I've just got a couple of questions and I've actually asked anyone who has questions to put them in the Q&A and I'll repeat those. But I was interested, and I think everyone would be interested, um, about have you found uh, the, the data is, get, is worse or have you had any way of testing over COVID-19, particularly now, well, especially here in Melbourne, of course, is still in lockdown? Well, we certainly know that mental health has taken a, a beating during COVID. Um, there hasn't at this stage been an increase in suicides, which is very, very good news. But certainly the information we have for research that um, our university has led and, and others are that there is a, a very quite large um, increase in distress. And that makes all sorts of sense. People have had, uh, you know, seen their businesses and their careers disappear. And it's, it, it's a very difficult, distressing mm. time. Very happily, we just in the last couple of days found out that we got funding from the Medical Research Future Fund to run a study looking at lifestyle support uh, for people with um, mental health problems that's being offered through Barwon Health and their, their clinical psychiatric services through telehealth. And so we hope to be able to start that early next year to evaluate uh, that program. So certainly mental health has uh, taken a hit. Diets, hard to say. Some people have started to cook at home, <laughs> which is probably a good thing. Uh, but others, of course, have probably, you know, resorted to the comfort eating because, you know, these foods are designed to interact with those reward systems and to make you feel comforted. All of the advertising goes into making you feel like this is going to make you feel better if you consume these food products. But we know that they're very, very toxic to our health. Sure. And uh, Kerry Schmidt asks, with the known link between diet and mental health, hospitals caring for those with mental illnesses now invest more in food for the patients? To we wish. Yes. We wish. It's such an important thing. Um, what we need, I think, for that to change is two things. One, we need more research evidence because without research evidence, you know, it's very difficult to get uh, governments and policymakers to change. Um, and then, of course, we need concerted effort from those within the system to make changes to the food environments in hospitals. But it's something that we're very aware of. It's something that I talk to uh, the big uh, health units about wherever I can to, to encourage them to change their food environment because it shouldn't be up to individuals. This is what we know. Because these foods are designed to make people want them and to eat them and to crave them, if you set up your food environment so that these foods are everywhere and in, for example, inpatient psychiatric units where that's what's on offer, where they can get Uber Eats to bring in the McDonald's, where all of uh, the vending machines are selling these sorts of foods, that environment then says, well, this is okay, please continue to eat these. Um, and we need to change the food environment right around the world to make healthy eating the easiest choice, the cheapest choice, the most socially acceptable choice. Sure. Thank you for that. Now, our, one of our other panellists, Anthony Mayer, has a question. Anthony. Um, sorry, thanks, Tim. I, I'm curious, given that the processed food industry is such a behemoth, it's, it's globally making lots of money for lots of people, how does an everyday Rotary Club counter their marketing or promote your research or the work that you do in a meaningful way? It's such a 
an important question. Um, we and many, many public health researchers right around the world can continue to advocate strongly to governments everywhere for proper food policies to address the food environment. But the simple fact is that um, the industrialised food system is bigger than anything. It's bigger than governments. It's bigger than the tobacco industry. It's, it's the largest industry uh, probably in the world. Their budgets for lobbying are just so huge um, that it's, it's almost impossible. And this is why we're so slow to see any sort of policy change at the level of government, even though we know that this is making every population so much sicker. And the costs, of course, to the public health system are huge, not just to individuals. Um, Rotarians, by supporting this research, by um, making sure that that message is embedded and that understanding is embedded really in, in anything they do, if they're running an event, for example, to have healthy food offerings, those sorts of things. Uh, that's all important. Um, if you were to promote my research through the network so that people have a good understanding of it, um, you know, the, the Food and Mood Centre website, as I said, is a great resource for people to learn more, all my books, all of those things are very helpful because Rotarians, they care. They, they're not involved because they don't care. They're, in, they're involved because they care. They want to improve things for themselves, for their families, for their grandchildren, all of those things. And this is critically important. In the US, and it will soon be the same in Australia, 60% of children alive today will be clinically obese by the time they're 35. So that's not overweight, that's clinically obese. And this is where kids are having, these young people are having their families. And that has huge implications for the physical and mental health of the next generation. Huge. In Australia, young people have on average seven serves of junk food a day. A day. Less than half a percent of Australian children are eating the recommended vegetables and legumes that they need for their gut, their immune system, their brain development, all of these things. It's a terrible situation and one that we should be regarding with as much seriousness as we do um, antibiotic resistance, for example, or any of those other things. So it's, it's really important and Rotarians have the opportunity to, to highlight that knowledge and to bring it to their families and communities. Thanks, Felicia. We've got a couple more questions, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Uh, McKee asks, given the fact that fast food is so dominant in the world, has there been any studies about the early years and whether mental health problems were dominant in the early years in the 20th century? Uh, so suggesting that um, mental health in, uh, in problems have increased in parallel with the changes in our I food. think that's, yep. Yeah. It's a really, really good question. It's a very tricky one to measure. So there have been some big research studies in the US that have managed to use the same questions and the same questionnaires over time in young people. And that's pretty much the only way that you can actually get a measure of change. And from that, we see that, yes, there has been a steady increase in the number of mental health, the sorts of mental health problems across the population. Many things, of course, contribute to poor mental health. And we've had also uh, across a similar time frame to, or possibly a shorter time frame, but more recently, the on, uh, you know, social media and many of the problems that come with that. We have changes to people's sleeping patterns. We have changes to all sorts of things that are fed into the risk factors for mental disorders. So teasing apart what's related to what is very tricky over time, but certainly... The data that we do have suggests there has been an increase in mental health problems and that's happened along the same trajectory as we have changes in the food environment. That doesn't mean that one is directly causing the other, but the research does suggest that it may play a role. Sure. Uh, I think we've got time for a couple more questions, if that's all right with everyone. Um, Jen Marshall from my club actually asked Felicia, Felice, what's your opinion on healthy meal plans like Light and Easy, You Foods, Weight Watchers? Look, if they help people to make those changes to their diet, then that's really useful. I think more powerful is to learn how to prepare foods yourself, of course, but that's not always easy for people who've not learned how to, to shop, how to prepare food. Uh, in that sense, I think it can be really useful. What we know from the SMILES trial, which I think is really fascinating, is that while people who came into the study with quite severe depression and poor diets 
whilst they managed to increase the number and the amount of healthy food that they were eating, the biggest change was in reducing the junk and processed foods that they were eating. On average, people uh, reduced their junk food intake by about 22 serves a week. So that's a big change. So those uh, light and easy and similar can be very powerful because they can displace those other foods and they can prompt people to stop eating those other foods. Uh, and they generally will have a good nutritional profile that will help things as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Ken Wall asks, and this is, uh, as all Rotary Clubs are moving back into, hopefully soon, face-to-face um, -face meetings, how do we get Rotary Clubs to have healthier food at their meetings? Ah, really good point. I think a lot of the traditional foods are actually quite fine. So if you're thinking about a traditional meal of meat and three veg, as long as the meat is a small serve and the veg is a large serve, <laughs> that's actually not a bad thing. Um, it's really the highly and ultra processed foods that are hugely problematic. The things that comes in, come in packets, the things with big long lists of additives, these are the really problematic things. There's no problem with having a bicky with your cup of tea sometimes. That's not the issue. The issue is these highly and ultra processed foods that are the chicken nuggets type of thing. Now, very, very simply speaking, if you want to make big improvements to your health, forget about your body weight. Don't worry. There's, that's almost irrelevant in this story. You increase the number and the diversity of the plant foods that you're eating. So that's not just your vegetables and your fruits. It's your whole grain cereals. So here with things like um, red and brown rice, quinoa, porridge oats, barley, rye, these sorts of things, those whole grain cereals, incredibly high in the fiber and the, the components that we know that the gut and the bacteria in the gut need to do what they do. Very importantly, legumes. Put a tip, tin of lentils into your spag bowl. Add a tin of chickpeas to your salad. Beans and lentils, absolutely the most fundamental uh, gut bacteria food. And then nuts and seeds as well. Try and have a handful of almonds, cashews, walnuts every day. Raw, these sorts of things make a big difference very quickly. So that's the first thing, increase the number and the diversity of the plant foods. The second thing is to avoid those highly and ultra processed foods. So that's a pretty simple message, really. Thank you. Uh, I know a lot of us in Rotary, uh, I'm not sure how many Rotary meetings you've been to, but we find it hard to recognise what we're getting fed anyway at those places sometimes. <laughs> oh, good on Greg. Greg. That's he's... Right. Look, he's got the almonds. They are magic for your brain, for your gut, for everything else. They are so good. And, you know, even if uh, at your Rotary dinners and things, encourage that some of the meals are non-meat based. It's all right to have a little bit of red meat, but really most of what we're eating should be plant-based. Mm, thank you. Uh, look, have you got time for a couple more? If that's... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bill Young actually says, do we need to change our Rotary traditional sausage sizzle then? As a fun oh, <laughs> I think that's a tough one. I think there'd be a, a revolt in the streets if, if Rotarians couldn't sell sausages outside Bunnings. I know <laughs> that everybody, and this is the thing, those sorts of foods are really, really bad for you if you eat them every day. But if you have them once a month as a treat, that's fine. Um, I do think it would be great if they offered some um, non-meat-based alternatives for all us vegetarians out there. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. And Greg Sampson asks, would you like to comment on the so-called superfoods like, I think, goji berries? <laughs> I always use goji berries as a bit of a punching bag because I think the message is very clearly, you don't need to worry about superfoods or organic or anything like that. That's very nice for those of us who can afford it uh, and who have access to those sorts of foods. But really, they're kind of red herrings. When you have less than 5% of adults and less than half a percent of children across Australia and similar across other Western countries, uh, having even the basics of the vegetables and the legumes that they need for health, worrying about superfoods is a kind of a, it's a, it's a distraction, if you like. And uh, quite a, a good question from Kerry Schmidt. Uh, you mentioned a link between mental health and criminal justice. Is mm -hmm. research going into the savings that could be made by helping people keep out of prison? Oh, 
honestly. By I, helping them manage health, mental health. We have diet. tried for years and years and years to get funding to develop a blueprint for prevention in Australia for the prevention of mental disorders. Now, I was the inaugural president of the Alliance for the Prevention of Mental Disorders in Australia, which was supported by Australian Rotary Health. Myself and Tony Jorm, who many of you will know, worked for years to try and get funding to develop a blueprint. But governments are not interested in, blue, in prevention because all of the costs are up front and the benefits are right down the track. It's so difficult. But part of that bid to get funding was to get um, proper economic evaluations done, the modelling done to say, if you could prevent here, these are the savings that you will get. Now, that sort of very basic work's been done in the UK and they show huge savings over, you know, the, the, the lifespan. If you prevent right at the start of life, and it makes sense, we all know that. That doesn't mean that governments listen to that because it's not in their best interest because all they care about is getting elected at the next election, which is a real shame and a real lost opportunity. Well, thank you very much. Felice, uh, and thank you for your honest answers to those questions. And oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for that. Um, and I'm sorry to those we've missed out on, but I'd like to now just pass back to our district governor, Mark Humphreys. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tim. And yeah, what, wasn't that absolutely fascinating? I mean, for, look, for many years, we've wondered and we've worried about the trends uh, in me mental health, and we've been seeing it become a bigger and bigger problem. And with all this amazing research and advances in size, yeah, why, why is it uh, still happening? What has changed to make so many people feel unwell? Fast food, junk food, I think has a lot to answer for. So Professor Felice, you today have certainly helped us to understand uh, a little bit of that link uh, so that we can actually do our own investigation and some of our own simple experiments at home. We can change what we're eating and see what some of those side effects might be. Yeah, and what better time? Well, we're still in, in a lockdown. So let, let's get on to some of those supermarkets and get some home deliveries and let's increase uh, some of the plant foods uh, that, that you were just talking about and uh, see what those side effects might be in, in, the, in the next few weeks even uh, of this lockdown. Uh, it's fascinating and also frightening to know that just how much of our own health depends on, on what we put uh, into our mouths. So we now know just a little bit more uh, about, uh, about the message. We have to get that message uh, out there. Um, we need to get uh, behind Australian Rotary Health uh, even more and really help support this great research that, that you have uh, certainly initiated uh, and one of the cornerstones uh, of this uh, you know, here Australia and obviously uh, globally. Um, yeah, so uh, Professor uh, Felice, uh, I thank you for your continued support of Australian Rotary Health. I look forward to uh, reading your books, uh, Brain Changer and There's a Zoo in My Poo. I know my, my wife, Linda, works in libraries uh, and she has certainly uh, looked at getting uh, uh, your books uh, into the library system. Uh, I've looked at your food and mood uh, website. I've seen a few recipes there, you never know. They just might uh, make their way uh, into a couple of the things that we try. And I know Linda has always tried to get me to eat Brussels sprouts. Well, you never know, I just might have to uh, give them uh, another go and, and see. I, I don't even love Brussels sprouts, except oh, that's good. <laughs> try them in garlic butter. Then. <laughs> <laughs> then they're okay. <laughs> oh, gee, I, I don't even know about that. <laughs> uh, now, Greg stole some of my thunder before. Uh, you know, Australian Rotary Health is one of the largest independent fundraising organisations for mental health. And yes, it did start here in our district. Uh, and what a legacy uh, Ian Scott uh, has certainly left uh, us to continue on uh, that great work uh, that he has done. And it is great to see that there are two uh, Ian Scott uh, fellowships uh, in progress uh, at the moment. So uh, the, the work that Australian Rotary Health really does change people's lives. And that's what we as Rotarians do uh, all the time. So Australian Rotary Health, 
Professor Felice Jacka, I thank you for the great work uh, and the research that you are doing. And I know that you will continue uh, to do that long into the future. And I also, while I've got this, a special thank you to Marty uh, for organising this today. Uh, Marty, it has been absolutely fantastic and most enlightening. And I urge everybody that's on here, go and speak to your clubs, whatever that club is. If it's a Rotary Club, go and talk to there. If you're uh, one of the guests from outside and you've got a community group, get in contact with Marty and ask her to come and share some of the great work that Australian Rotary Health is doing uh, in this uh, country of ours. So thank you, uh, Professor Jacker. Thank you, Marty, uh, for today. Uh, and keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you for not denigrating red wine. I would never do that. Not you. <laughs> not me either. <laughs> Thank you, Felice. That's great. And uh, I'll just on the, uh, I'll get Anthony Mayer to perhaps uh, have a chat about how people can donate to Australian well, Health. Uh, thank you, Tim. And thank you very much, Felice. And uh, in that presentation, there was a question, how do we make a difference? How do we help, especially given the behemoths out there that are producing processed food? And one of the ways, obviously, is to support Rotary Australian, Australian Rotary Health. So today, if you're watching this video, uh, this uh, webinar, or if you're streaming it afterwards, please, if you could support Australian Rotary Health, I'm going to show you how. So if you can go to australianrotaryhealth.com.au, um, so that's Australia, sorry, .org.au, australianrotaryhealth.org.au. It's not .com.au, it's .org.au, Australian Rotary Health. You'll see a screen that looks like this, and then you want to look for the button that looks like this. And I'll show you live on the screen, the Australian Rotary Health screen here. We click on the um, donate button, and it will take us to the screen to donate. And you'll see here, one of the things that I want you to notice, you can choose your amount. Um, if um, Tim, can you just check? Can you see my screen there? Thanks, thank you. So you can choose your donation amount there. You can put in, and it depends how um, uh, generous you'd like to be there. But one of the things I'd like everybody just to note is where your donation goes. If you could just click on where your donation goes, scroll down to lift the lid, and make sure that your donation goes to lift the lid, please. The rest of the form's pretty self-explanatory. You'll notice that it is a secure form, so you don't have to worry about your privacy. If you can enter your, your card or your payment details in there, and then you just donate down here. So it's really that easy. Go to australianrotaryhealth.org.au. There is a big donate button on the page, and that's how you can support Australian Rotary Health. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much, Anthony. And I'd like to now pass back to Marty Shepherd to sum up. Thank you very much. Police, thank you very much. And to everyone, if you could contribute to Australian Rotary Health to fund their ongoing wonderful causes and research to support such valuable contributors to society, such as Police, police Jacker, that would be wonderful. So on behalf of District 9820, thank you very much, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.